Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday night's Narrative Live. A big show tonight as we talk about Elon Musk and Twitter. Just a little bit to talk about there, isn't there? Eric Garland, a little bit? Just a little something? Twitter. Yeah, you've heard of it, right? I'm trying to think of where I heard of it. It's a little thing. It's a little thing. It's small time, you know, social network. Some people make their livings off it. I mean, I might be or, one of those That's not the one... Not the one where they, you have like you can have somebody knit something for you and make a T-shirt for your band, or no, no, that's the other kind. What's it called? That's a uh, Etsy, I think. That's what they call that one. Which is the platform that gets leveraged by um, hostile foreign intelligence services? I forget. Oh well, the Facebook. That's Facebook. Not all of them, right? Yeah. Well, fa- yes, true. But Facebook in particular, we like Facebook to do that. But also Google. You're right. Sometimes. There is actually a, uh, a news report that came out about how all these platforms have been responding to fake law enforcement requests, giving uh, private data over that compromises kids. So oh. that's going to be great for the stock price. Well, there you go. Oh. Uh, this is all different because this is now not going to be on the stock market at all. Twitter is going private under this new regime oh. under Elon Musk. So there'll be no regulation by the SEC, no regulation really by anybody because private- it'll be his own private fiefdom, as it were. Well, that depends on how many partners they have in the deal. Oh, there's more than one partner. I thought it was just him because he's the world's richest man. (laughs) Um, (laughs) If there's, uh, I believe, over 200 individual investors pooling, then they'll still have to to do um, reports to the SEC. Oh, that's interesting. He says not. I think he's saying that it's just all his money, but I, you know, we'll go through that tonight. We are going to take a look at every aspect of Elon Musk's attempt to acquire Twitter. And I'll say it as an attempt because, frankly, it hasn't been approved by shareholders. It's only been approved by the board. Sure, Jack Dorsey said, go for it. Go, you know, it's a good idea. But there's a lot of shareholders that might disagree with this, but there's also regulatory hurdles that could be put in the place of this uh, approval. And uh, who knows if it'll get approved? So people shouldn't jump to the conclusion that it gets approved right away. It's going to take three to six months before we'll know for sure that Elon Musk, in fact, has Twitter. And in the meantime, we'll be able to navel gaze a lot and see exactly what he's up to and see maybe there's some you know loopholes, perhaps, in what he's doing. Maybe there's some things that he's not doing according to the books. And maybe he has some foreign interests himself that are questionable. And those are the kinds of things I think that are worthy of uh, you know us exploring tonight because it's what we do here on Narrative a lot. It's... Uh, you know, he says that he welcomes, by the way, all his worst critics, his most ferocious critics. He hopes that those are the people that will stay on Twitter because he'll welcome them on Twitter in his new regime. So even if is we, FBI not- counterintelligence on Twitter? Sorry? <laughs> uh, is FBI counterintelligence on? You said his worst critics. Is FBI <laughs> counterintelligence on Twitter? No, I, I know. As far as I know, I, I don't know. They probably are. You'd imagine they would be. Uh, um, IRS criminal has a great Twitter site. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Just a thought. Yeah. I've, I've seen FBI <laughs> on, on Twitter. I should, I should have seen that. So, you know, maybe it's not his most ferocious critics. There are other people that are, might be a little bit more critical. And it's really only particularly related to this thing that we're critical about. But there are some other things that we've been you know, not so nice to Elon Musk. But he'll keep us on Twitter, he's promised, because that's what he wants for Twitter. That's the, the plan he has. And there's no reason why we would think that that's uh, not going to be the case. So um, I did a nice little graphic to explain what I'd like to do tonight because uh, it, it looks cute, and it's, it's called, What's Tearing Apart Elon Musk? You see his face is all torn apart like that? That's, That's how great. He feels. Yeah, isn't it a nice graphic? Very proud That's of a that. nice graphic. Yeah, I think yeah, I spent way too much time probably on that part of it, and not enough time setting up for the show, which is why we are a little, sh- <laughs> <laughs> a little bit uh, devoid of our normal uh, razzmatazz here. But um, <laughs> we can do jazz hands as well, so we can still do jazz hands. <laughs> Jazz the narrative hands. is running short on the pass. <laughs> oh, no. Um, that's explaining the, the pure black background that we have tonight. So there's a bunch of things uh, tearing Elon Musk apart. Do you want to guess what might be the first? Mm, let's see. His, his company, Tesla, there depends on a lot of Chinese supply chain uh, for battery manufacturing. You're jumping and ahead, but United that's very good. You get 10 points on that. You get 10 points on that, but maybe just a little bit ahead of time. But that's good because that's what's coming up, everybody. Sorry. But also, uh, the fact that he's, you know, he's the world's richest man, they say. He's a god, basically. 268 billion or something like that. You know how many 268 billion is? It's it's a f- unfathomable amount. Um, and that's how much his net worth is based on all his assets. His assets basically are Tesla, a company called SpaceX, which does SpaceX exploration, a company called The Boring Company, which does 
boring, which is uh, tunnels under the ground. And soon sure. it will include this Twitter empire that he's building. However, you know, in order to buy this Twitter thing that he bought today, he had to spend a lot of money. He had to spend, in, they think, about $44 billion, which when you look between that, in fact, he's worth $268 billion, 44 is about 20% of his wealth. 20% to buy Twitter, the third rate, not so important, financially at least, not that great performing business. Uh, social network is what he's spending 20% of his net value with, of, which is an astonishing amount of money, really, when you think about it. And the only way he could get that 20% is by d- doing 10% as a loan, which he got from a bank. That 10% as a loan was so e- equal to about $25 billion, and that was the loan that he got from some bank. We don't even sure which bank yet, but he got a loan from a bank. $21 billion <laughs> of, his, of his own money is also going in. I'm not sure where he's getting that additional money because I didn't think he had $21 billion just lying around. But let's say he's got $21 billion lying around and he's throwing in $25 billion that he's loaned against his Tesla stock, right? That's, that's interesting that he, the only way he could get that money from the bank to buy Twitter was to borrow against his Tesla stock which is one of the reasons the stock price plummeted today because they had to sell that Tesla stock in order to get this money to him. So that's interesting too. So they claim, so some people claim. Who knows if they really sold it? Who knows what really dropped that Tesla and, uh, stock price? We'll find out in a second. Or maybe, who, maybe. And, and- and who had short positions? Oh, yeah. Who had, yeah. And who <laughs> had so short smart. positions? Yes. There might be people who have to uh, be play this a little bit because, you know, they could play this a little bit. We'll talk about Donald Trump's a truth social performance as well because of this a little later on because that impacts that as well. But, you know, this gets a little geeky here, but all of this actually adds about $1 billion to $1.3 billion in interest. Because Twitter no, didn't have this huge debt before, but now they're going to have a debt that they have to pay off of about a billion dollars. So I don't know why Twitter has to pay for it, but I guess it's his company, so it doesn't matter. It's all his money. Who cares? Uh, he's got $264 billion. Now he'll have $220 billion, and, uh, and the rest will be carried by Twitter. Sounds divine, right? Sounds like an incredible uh, opportunity for everybody involved, including and only including Elon Musk, because he's the only one really involved in this. So as we mentioned, his stock price went down. Uh, Tesla stock value today dropped $128 billion. That might be because of the sell-off of his, his shares, but it could also be because there's a lot of competition in the electronic vehicle space. You know, he used to be the only guy in the electronic vehicle space. Tesla was the market leader. They had the only car that did this thing. It was a niche play, really, but it was the only niche play. So if you wanted to get involved in electric vehicles, you would go there. But now there's a whole array of other car manufacturers doing even better cars than the Tesla, and they'll be flooding the market in the next year. So there's some concern in the marketplace that maybe Tesla's stock price is going to go kaboom. And maybe we're starting to see some of that today, because today was a bit of a sell-off day on the NASDAQ and elsewhere, but his stock price went down even further. So it's probably related as well to sort of the knockback around um, him buying Twitter. A lot of people are very critical of him buying Twitter, and we'll detail that in a second. So again, let's put up the financials here. Just everyone remembers he's worth $264 billion. He's spending $25 billion as a loan to buy Twitter, and then $21 billion of his so-called own money who knows if that really is his own money that requires a lot of investigation and it's all going to be quite difficult for the people at at twitter because we're talking about an additional billion dollars at a company that barely made a billion dollars in profit so you know he's wiping out all the profit currently at twitter just to pay off this interest that doesn't seem like a good business move to me but i you know i'm not a ceo i'm not a mogul of a major corporation but i don't know what do you think so say that again, what's the structure that are trying to pay off interest on, on what? Yeah, on this loan that he's acquiring, you know, he's got to pay off this debt, the interest of this debt that he's using to buy Twitter, the $25 billion. So it's going to add a billion dollars to the bottom line of Twitter. Now, that's difficult because so to the, the bottom line or to the liabilities to the liability well to the annual cost of uh annual costs i don't know what that is that's the annual expenses is going to be an interest line that says so, annual I mean, expenses one take- billion dollars. So there's going to be a billion dollars in interest every 12 months on the loan for the month. So he doesn't, well, he doesn't have the money then if <laughs> well, like this is real. Yeah. He doesn't there's have the money. There's a hand yet. going on here. So, he, yeah. you know, so he's not spending, he's spending someone else's money. Well, but, well okay. he's leveraging so, his so Tesla stock. Bank, but are they doing a bond offering? 
he's taking the value of his Tesla stock and he's selling 10% of his Tesla stock or, or leveraging against that Tesla stock 10% of the, and then he'll get a loan for that, which is going to be worth $25 billion. Now, but the interest payments on that loan, it appears to the people I've been reading, sure. uh, will be paid by Twitter itself, not by him. So in, in buying Twitter, he's now adding a billion dollars worth of debt to Twitter. So as a shareholder, you must be thinking, well, well, that's worth, but my profit was $1 billion. I was getting a little piece of that $1 billion. And now you're taking all of that and wiping it out, but you're not a shareholder anymore because you've, you've been paid out by him and you're, he's the only shareholder. So welcome to the private equity hustle. Um, yes. You know, I want to see more of the details on this. You may know I had an, an experience several years ago, 2013. After Thanksgiving, I looked around my local guitar center, so mm. which is the largest music manufacturer in the United States. And I had been told by a friend, oh, it's a junk bond. Right? I couldn't figure out why it would be. And I was in there Black Friday right after Thanksgiving, and there's like nobody in the shop. Then I started looking at their finances, and I was like, wow, these guys are super in debt. And they had been bought by Bain Capital, which was Mitt Romney's company that, that he company. started. Investor number two being Robert Maxwell. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Interesting. So they had bought Guitar Center in 2007, and I started looking into the background of it. And I really got a good sense of the modern public to private hustle they have like an accordion process it's like you take a company public then you take it you get a bunch of private equity take it private uh then you fix up you spit it back out public again but one of the big parts of that is you have management you know if it's a private equity company you have you charge the corporation management fee so you can take a perfectly healthy company and i don't know you know twitter's exact profitability but if you take a company that's financially stable and profitable and, you know, public, and then you take it private, what these guys often do is load it up with debt and whoever, you know, puts the deal together, it's not their money. They, you know, they collect this very often from um, funds that are going to people's retirements. You know, it's where you, people invest in ETFs, so exchange traded funds or whatever. And the fund managers there, they buy all sorts of, they can invest in corporate bonds or, you know, these kind of debt deals and often um they make the interest rate really really high yeah when they don't even necessarily have to they just rate the paper that way especially if they take on so much debt that they then have to service then that justifies the ratings agencies to say oh well this is subprime or it gets down towards junk and anyway the whoever put that money together they get paid you know a, a lot and a lot can be 11 per, some of these private equity deals are six percent eight percent eleven percent when money for corporations if it's a good solid corporation you know you might be paying the prime rate plus 1.8 or whatever so you're getting corporate paper for, you know, you're capitalizing your business for 2.2%. Imagine doing a, a mortgage like that, average yeah. person. It's, yeah. you know, it'd be, you know, it's like having good nice credit. if you could do um, that, but you couldn't do that. Right? And if, you have, you know, if you have good credit, it's yeah. cheaper. And so they, they take these companies that would normally qualify for cheaper money, mm -hmm. and then they load them up with debt, and then the managers all pay themselves out with all kinds of bonuses and services fees and all this, and then they strip the company out, and then they, you know, they'll, tart the, the numbers up and then throw it back out to the public and then list it on the uh, stock exchange again. And it's called sending it to the dumb money. Well, you know, could, I'm not saying well, that's what's happening here, but, but it could be something is. like that because look, they make only a billion dollars of profit a year. So they're wiping up all that profit basically. And they're going to instead use that money to pay off interest, which means there's no money going anywhere else. They're also going to be paying all the employees of the company who have stocks and any other shareholders, at the time of sale, everyone's going to get a cash check or cash amount of money saying thank you for your shares at 30% higher value than its current value at the stock price. So that's a lot of money you're, sh you're just handing out to your, to your staffers and to your board members and to whomever who, you know, who are working for you at the time. And it might not want to work for you anymore now that you've handed them a huge amount of money. So he could be destroying the entire company structure, which has for years put together a pretty solid system where there was a sense that you're kind of safe on Twitter up until now. You, you're sort of safe, not completely safe, but kind of safe uh, posting things on Twitter. I mean, that is the Saudi spy issue and, and a few other issues, yeah. but, but kind of safe, kind of safe, right? Kind of safe. Yeah. So... 
you know, he's going to tear all that apart and probably send all the staffers who built all that running. I mean, you know, a lot of people in this Twitter staff today were not so enamored by the news when they heard about Elon Musk. Here's one Twitter employee saying the news today is so crazy. I literally forgot I have COVID, um, which would be, you know, that's something to forget about. Um, and then, you know, there was a couple of other reactions, some of which have now been removed from Twitter, unfortunately. But a lot of people were a little bit stunned, to say the least. Lots of tears, uh, emojis were sent out. It was a pretty devastating day for people at Twitter. And he's going to now have to address the Twitter staffers because they're a little bit upset that they don't really know what's going on to with their company that they've been working for and building a long time. And he doesn't have the best reputation in terms of, you know, supporting free speech and other things that he claims to support, which is maybe we should talk about next. I mean, maybe we should talk about, because um, I, I do want to get to all the other stuff, but he has this odd notion of free speech. You know, that's his big thing that he wants to do. He wants to make, he wants to like celebrate free speech. He's now the free speech dude. And then today he issues this tweet where he kind of, he does, he sort of walks back his free speech idea a little bit because today he said, by free speech, I simply mean that which matches the law. I'm against censorship that goes beyond the law. If people want less free speech, they will ask their government to pass laws to that effect. Therefore, going beyond the law is contrary to the will of the people. That's a very interesting thing. I don't know what that means. It means that there is a law. <laughs> I mean, I, and the those law are definitely... is what he will follow. So if you're the Communist Party of China, for example, and you want to pass a law that says no free speech, then he's okay with that because that's the law of the people, even though it's not a democracy. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's going to basically follow the law of every country that he is working with. He's not where originally he was like, let's enter this whole new era of free speech where everyone can say whatever they want to say. He's no longer saying that. He's now saying, I'll just follow the law of every country, which sounds sensible, except it does sort of takes away from the free speech warrior thing that he was presenting to the world just a few days ago. He's now just saying, I'm going to do the same thing Twitter has always done and just follow the laws of these countries. And, you know, and therefore I'm not such a free speech warrior after all. Yeah, I mean, yeah. My, the biggest issue for speech that I have on Twitter is I don't have a problem with people's speech, but the free speech rights of a stack of 23,000 Huawei phones in Moldova being operated by Russian intelligence to seed all of our, you know, conversations. That's the yeah. kind of speech that we really need. We still haven't quite unpacked, you know. He says he's going to get out. rid of those. He says he's going to get rid of those by authenticating every human, which means they are going to be tracking every human and what they're going to say on Twitter, because that sounds very free to me. I mean, if you're going to allow people to say whatever they want to say, that's great. But now they're going to say, we're also going to track you when you say whatever you want to say. So that's not so, but that they, doesn't sound so free. But, well, here's the thing, though. They're kind of... Um, kind of telling on themselves there because you know they can already do that they already are doing that i mean they've authenticated got, everybody they just start saying hey who are you give us your phone number now they're going to authenticate you whatever that might mean but they haven't they they have if you have an application on your phone that yeah. has twitter in it <laughs> I know. and they know where you're tweeting from right the place you tweet most from is likely your house you know yeah i think uh, these companies have more data than we come to understand i think so i think they won't be letting us people just post under pseudonyms and what have you i think they're going to want to be authenticating you as an individual human and you'll have one account and you'll be allowed to say what you need to say and they'll be able to track you as whenever you say it. So, I think, you know, it does dull free speech. I, in some ways that people might say, that's great. Let's only the authenticated people speak. But on the other hand, it doesn't really allow anybody to say anything that they want because anything that they want is going to be publicly facing and, you know, they have to think about what effect that might have on their workplace, on their social lives and all those other things. I'm kind of in favor of that. I mean, here's the thing, like, you know, after I came out in 2016 and said, hey, there's Russia and they do Russia things and we should look at that. You know, I got attacked by, you know, botnets uh, of, you know, people repeating the same sorts of abuse. Uh, I had, you know, people who were paid and, and other people who were just organically didn't like what I had to say, who got to operate under this cloak of anonymity. Um, you know, I, I use my own name. Yeah, and I that's how they knew how to, you know, write stories about me and stuff like that that weren't very flattering and whatnot. I mean, there's a cost in society. You know, if you go to the mall and you just start, you know, 
screaming at people going by, you might get thrown out or people will say jerk, you know, or they'll see a, a, elsewhere at the grocery store. It's, it's society. There's some consequences to your social behavior. And I think Twitter and other, uh, other social media platforms, they really are the town square mm-hmm. um, that have made possible by this amazing technology. And I think it's overall pretty awesome. Very often there's a wild west period with new technologies. I mean, if you think of, you know, how powerful film and television can be in educating or, you know, communicating historical moments really can be a positive thing. But you also have Lenny Riefenstahl and the the Nazis, like the, you know, first round of, you know, mass media is like, you know, what if we snuffed out democracy with this technology? And, you know, it wasn't the only thing behind it, of course, but it was a major there's almost like no immune system to the propaganda that they created that, you know, in in creating emotions, uh, attaching the German people to the rise of Hitler. And I mean, you know, a lot of people still study those films. I mean, they're amazing. Um, in fact, there was a lot of Trump ads. (laughs) Yeah. There there's, um, you know, they were surprising. Oh, you look at the uh, the tiki torch thing. That's yeah. forget, I forget. Is the Bible one of those? The upside down Bible? That was something else. Something like that. Yeah. There was a whole bunch of th- things that have direct analogs to the the Nazi propaganda, which was probably yeah. a wink from yeah. whoever <laughs> was uh, was putting that together. That. Well, I was just saying we have a Wild West period, and then sometimes we figure out, mm, you know, we need to have some regulations, or you know, there's we need to be careful about this use of this technology. I think social media, you know, this is going to be the way we communicate going forward, most likely, uh, as long as these, uh, you know, this type of technology is still available, you know, we're still at this level of sophistication and don't slide backwards. And, you know, the Wild West here was, you know, we put these things up, people put their data up and they put incredibly sensitive things up about themselves. They conducted conversations. And it's not a surprise that some of the, you know, successor agencies to like Russian intelligence and the Stasi and whatnot. I mean, this is a dream come true for autocrats to be able to mm. peer inside your your private life and your public life and everything else. And, and also to be know, able to run these intelligence ops with all these trolls and bots and things. I mean, that's a dream come oh, true yeah. for anybody because they have the means to control the narrative. And that's, of course, a big deal in the world these days when everything is about Huge. narrative warfare. So we've mentioned Mm -hmm. that he's so so so-called rich. Mr. Elon Musk is so-called rich. Then there's this thing called LIDAR or LIDAR. I think it's LIDAR. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the kind of uh, imaging intelligence that is. It's It's uh, a uh, lights and radar together. LIDAR. Yeah. Okay. And it's basically the technology that every other company except Tesla is using to make their electronic vehicles safe for you and me and whoever wants to buy their electronic vehicles. Now, Elon Musk has for the longest time said, we don't need LIDAR. Tesla doesn't need LiDAR. It's just not, a, it's not necessary technology. Uh, everyone else, every single other company in the world that makes cars did use LiDAR in their cars. And the results are quite telling. If you want to take a look at this little clip that Drive Magazine put together, it's quite revealing what LiDAR does and what LiDAR doesn't do. So just as a quick, uh, before I get there, you see this little, under this is a little weird brown, gray photo uh, next to Elon Musk's ear over there. That's basically what light and radar does together. It gives you depth perception as when you're driving your car automatically. So Drive Magazine's Patrick Moorhead drove the Tesla that doesn't have the LiDAR at night and we'll see the results of that. And then he drove another car that does uh, have the LiDAR and see the results of that. So let's take a look. This is with Tesla Y with no LiDAR and that's a, oh, that's a child in the way. And oops, that's not, no longer, a, a bit, not a real child, but you get the idea. This is the LiDAR enabled one. Look at him, he's coming around the corner and there's the dummy child. Oh, oh, the car automatically stops. That is a significant difference if you're looking for a car, especially if you have a family or just if you want to be safe on the road in any way. That's the Tesla careening right through. And, uh, and here's the LiDAR enabled thing. So, I mean, I'm not a car expert. I don't know. Maybe LiDAR isn't that big a deal, but it seems to me like that's pretty, um, it's pretty telling. And so there's a lot of question marks because as we'll find out soon, there's new cars coming to the market to compete with the Tesla. 
and they all have LIDAR. They're just better at this. They're better at navigating as autopilots around, around night, around objects. And the, the Tesla is not so good at that. What's so, the what's the car company that's launching the new thing? Oh, every other company, um, GM, Ford, VW, every single other, like 17 other companies around the world that are developing electric vehicles are all going with LiDAR. They believe in that technology as the technology. It was the must uh, maybe trying it as well now because he's, you know, he missed the opportunity to, to do it earlier on. He said it was not important. But now there are rumors that Tesla is testing LiDAR. So We'll see how that goes for them. But they certainly are behind on that because they did have the advantage in the marketplace as being the electric vehicle up until now. So, you know, mm-hmm. they're valued at a lot. They're a very valuable company. And uh, when you really look at the technology underpinning them, they no longer have the leading technology in the world. Um, and that makes people say, well, maybe this whole Twitter thing is a bit of a, you know, let's just um, deflect. Let's run a little PR up, let's make some noise over here. So people don't notice today's launch of the Ford electric vehicle, for, for example, um, which was a the most popular vehicle in America, the F something, 130 pickup truck or something. Um, F-150? Yeah, it's extremely popular. It's not my kind of car. I'm not that kind of guy. But, you know. You're a you cosmopolitan elite. Yeah, yeah. We can I'm tell a- you're not American. <laughs> Wait a minute. You don't, you don't, you've never tried that. Never mind. It doesn't matter. It's, it, it's the F-150. It, yeah, it's, it's apparently a very popular vehicle. And uh, it was it was released today. Uh, officially publicly and, and it's, it's quite remarkable that it's an electric vehicle and then just last week gm introduced their new electric vehicle the lyric and i'll show you a little bit of that in a minute so there's a lot of competition there's a vw car that's come out there's you know just a lot of cars that are newly introduced into the marketplace that are going to be competing with mr Musk tesla meaning mm. maybe the market share is going to drop a little bit there Maybe he's not going to be as rich as he is right now. Maybe the people who really own Tesla, who really own Elon Musk, are trying to find a way to you know, extend the good times for a little bit so they can maybe get some of the money out of there if they need to. Or who knows what other scheme they might have, these rich people. I don't know. You know, it's possible. Um, so that's something to watch because, honestly, the price that he's paying for Twitter is linked to his Tesla stock. So... Yeah, that becomes yeah, tricky. Though, if the Tesla stock starts dropping, maybe you can't pay the price for Twitter. You know, hmm. every time I've seen deals that have the stock for stock trade or something like that, where there's a big variable in there, that can be really complicated. Yeah. I've seen it go. I've seen it go bad. I'm just thinking strategically there uh, for Tesla. You know, they have a, they have a factory in Shanghai there, and yeah. he's got a lot of uh, contacts to the the Chinese government. You know, about a year plus ago, you had a brand new treaty come out. Uh, There were four parties to it, the United States, Australia, India, and Japan. And it's called the Quad. Mm -hmm. And their entire raison d'etre was to break the Chinese hold on the mining and processing of rare earths for Mm -hmm. batteries. Because here's the thing, the dead dinosaur food-fueled economy, fossil fuels, it's it, there's a just an expiration date on that it's yeah. we're, we're going to be transitioning there's going to be i don't think you're ever going to see gasoline and you know petroleum go away i i doubt you'll see uh natural gas necessarily go away coal you might see go away but we're going to be transitioning to a grid uh you know if, if battery technology comes along the way it looks like it's going to <coughs> that's the way fleet vehicles are going and you know you'll be able to charge them you know through solar and through novel forms of wind generation there's a lot of adoption and new technology that's going to be going on there and china was trying to own all of that yes they were trying to own the future on that and um you know about a year ago the united states led the way and said nope we're going to lock them out of that we were, we've got to take that critical industry yeah. back from this autocracy and India had lined up with them very tight and so had Japan. And so this is when I knew that the strategic landscape was changing against China and Russia very quickly. It was sort of like, all right, guys, enough, you know, yeah. with Russia, it's their, you know, invasions of Ukraine and their election interference. And with China, it's like, Hey, stop sending us bricks of fentanyl so big it'll kill all of ohio we're done with that and we're sick of you 
And frankly. the rare earth minerals, we'd also like, uh, you know, we're going to have some of those and we're not going to let you run away with yep. all of those around the world, including all the way in Africa, which they've done a pretty good job of, uh, oh, yeah. of you know, monopolizing the African earth, rare earth minerals market. And that's not going to happen anymore. I mean, that's just clearly not sustainable for China. It's a foreign policy that's just foolhardy, really. It's a stupid foreign policy because they can't maintain it. And, you know. Short of destroying yeah. America, you can't really maintain that kind of position. So, huh. yeah, it's almost like you wonder why they supported uh, Donald Trump and other things. So, yeah, hmm. you, it's interesting because you're leading me right into the next thing. But I should also mention that Jay wants to say on our red phone messaging service, he says, great story about Guitar Center, Eric. It's a good story. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, here's what happened today. Speaking of China. This is the outlook for the electronic vehicle market in China, which was quite buoyant, as you could tell, up until recently. And then it's sort of with COVID in China and various other things has basically fallen off a cliff. Uh, it's back huh. where it was before China. So Mr. Musk sells a lot of Teslas into the Chinese marketplace. That's a big part of where he makes a lot of his money. It's a, it's a formidable mm. part. He used to be considered like a hero, a god over there in China. Lately, not so much. You know, he was really celebrated for his success in the world and, and the Tesla vehicle also celebrated. But I guess there have been issues with the Tesla vehicle in terms of if it's availability, it's about um, and some of its uh, features. And also now because of COVID and supply chain issues, Tesla's not doing so well. In fact, the electronic vehicle market's not doing so well. And Tesla's a big piece of that. So people on, online are asking good questions about this. So now you're the owner of Twitter, right? And here you are asking, and say you want, you know, you want to sell more cars, or you want the Chinese to allow you to sell more cars. You know, are you going to be allowed to do that? Or is China going to say to you, well, about you know, issue X or issue Y, change what you're saying? So here's Melissa Chen, who's a, uh, a journalist advice. She says Elon Musk has a Tesla factory in China, and he wants to. And he, want, and he wants to sell more cars there, as many China observers note. What happens if Beijing leans on him about, say, a Uyghur or Hong Kong activist account about Chinese disinformation bots leveraging this platform? Hmm. Interesting question. If Elon Musk thinks because he's the world's richest man that he can tell China to piss off if Beijing ever starts, did I write this? That's, this is my <laughs> style. To piss off if Beijing ever starts leaning on him about Twitter. He'll find out how efficiently the Chinese state can gobble up that Tesla Shanghai factory, taking it with it as much IP as it can. Well, right. But, you know, a few countries are as effective with linkage diplomacy as China. Put another way, China is not the SEC. Elon Musk can't give Beijing the middle finger as easily as he does a U.S. federal agency. Yeah. Valid point. It's a really valid point. She's goes, she's saying what everyone's thinking. You know, China has a lot of sway over this guy. He's this is his baby. Tesla is his baby. This is the most important thing he's ever done in his life. And all he needs to do is keep selling Tesla cars. So if China says to him, you know, do this or do that, we'll let you sell more cars. He will, he will do that because Tesla's his baby. It led Jeff Bezos to say, interesting question. Did the Chinese government just gain a bit of leverage over the Whoa. town square? Um, oh. This is after Mike Forsyth, the uh, New York Times reporter said, apropos of some things, uh, Tesla's second biggest market in 2021 was China, after the United States. Chinese battery makers are a major supplier of Tesla's EVs. And after 2009, when China banned Twitter, the government there had almost no leverage over the platform. That may have just changed. A little later, Bezos added to his comment, because he obviously got some feedback. He said, my own answer to this question is probably not. The more likely outcome in this regard is complexity in China for Tesla rather than censorship. At Twitter. <laughs> but we'll see. Musk is extremely good at navigating this kind of uh, <laughs> chaos or something like that. that is, but, you know, I, walk, man, walk I, guess, of sorts. I, I got more respect for Bezos now than I've had before. That is some quality shade. Right yeah. There. And, and good shade. I mean, it's actually true and accurate. And Bezos knows yeah. something or two about uh, China and he knows a thing or two about the export market. So he's not coming from an uninitiated place. Uh, oh, no. he, knows how, he knows how to deal with foreign governments. I As, mean, realistically, he's one of uh, Musk's few peers, at least in terms of, you know, they're, they're yeah. both com they're competitors in a way in space. And, you know, they've been in the tech sector a long time. And yeah. he's pointing, you know, it is interesting that he is pointing out the foreign compromise mm -hmm. of somebody. I mean, that's, you know, 
FBI counterintelligence is probably smiling at their desk. Like, thank you. Yeah, they must be considering that it's a big issue at various levels of the law and order facilities or organizations in America, because you can't really have a foreign government have influence over your town square. You are really not... We've seen this sort of happen in media a little bit, and it's terrible in television and yeah. other. Yeah. So, can you imagine in the town square if suddenly people were, as you know, China has had a habit of having people disappear off their version of Twitter, the entire, uh, they, having people just disappear off social media completely if they don't like what you know, tennis player X or TV star they Y. They just have. Saying. Uh, if Beijing wants, they'll just have you disappear yeah. bodily. Yes, well, they could do that too, but they, they do. They, they, do they that give social. themselves all the options. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they could escalate but, for sure. Well, you know, it's not just North America here, right? Who needs to be concerned about this? If this, you know, there is no French version of Twitter, right? Yeah, There's is, so. it's using the same protocols. There's no German uh, version of same. You know, these platforms are world dominating, and they, you know, they're based in the United States, and you know. U.S. laws uh, have generally guided behaviors there, though there's been, you know, there's been some significant scans, such as the fact that, like, Facebook is apparently the world's largest repository of child sex abuse media. Hmm. Real problem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Twitter, there is no really replacement for it in any of these countries. Right. And it is, you know, these heads of state tweet you know, Emmanuel Macron wins the election a couple of days back and is immediately on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's an important, it's the it's most important, important uh, vehicle we have in terms of communicating fast moving information. There is nothing as fast as Twitter in terms of getting news out or getting opinion out or information out. And it is, that's what one of the reasons that makes it so sophisticated and important and not something you want to let slip into the hands of your biggest adversary in the world. You just don't want it to right. slip into their hands. First of all, I mean, that was, it's amazing you, you put it that way about Twitter, because that was its initial proposition, and it succeeded wildly. wildly. I mean, it was like, yeah. you know, Facebook was about social connection, and Twitter is about what is happening right now. Right now. And who's telling you, and how much trust do you have in that account? You know, it's proven invaluable. And I think you and I are both in, in accord that, uh, you know, despite having pretty good information that even other TV producers may borrow mm. uh, without attribution from time happens, to time. happens occasionally, you know. Uh, you know, not no like names. we know. We don't have to mention any names. So. <laughs> I, I, it wouldn't be right. I, I, sometimes <laughs> people suggest shows and I'm like, you know, if I want to see my, my friend's <laughs> ideas two weeks later, I'll just talk to my friend <laughs> Yeah, some people, uh, sometimes people borrow, but you know, it's, it's a flattering thing, but it is fast. I mean, Twitter is, it's, you, you say it and it's out there. The world gets to see it instantly. It gets RT'd, it gets moved around. It is a remarkable thing. It is remarkable right now that this broadcast can be seen around the world. There is no single thing on television right now that can be seen around the world instantly, but there is on Twitter. That's and true. It's, and this is it, by the way, this is a, kind of a first in Twitter because we're the only ones who've sort of started doing this. And I guess there are others now, but my point is that, you know, this is a global thing. You can say something now on live TV, on Twitter, and it'll be heard in Beijing or heard in anywhere in the world. That is a very new phenomenon for, for television. It used to cost a lot of money to do that. Hey, so the, the squoosh mellows I have back there, yeah. that's not free. Yeah, no. I mean, this set. Oh, yeah. Th- Beautiful. This set oh, costs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. You sponsors, I see. That's yeah, d- yeah. sponsored by Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, th- we should just wrap up the China thing a little bit. You know, you know who's a fan of Donald Trump? No one. Um, like the Chinese, they sort of like him. The, you know, Xi and the Communist Party of China, they seem to be uh, quite supportive of Donald Trump. You know, the Yeah, they gave him president. $200 million uh, that he yeah. didn't tell us about in his financial disclosure. Yeah, uh-huh. there's all sorts of little deals that he got. In fact, we did this a while ago. You know, there's a whole oh. array of Chinese-related oh. interests that flow around Donald Trump. Everyone from the Adelsons who made their money in Macau, of Chinese gangsters and that casino money to you know steve bannon i remember steve eric prince another guy who worked directly for the chinese communist party's cynic i think steve bannon of course well known as being a part of the guao 
false information, false spy campaign that they did. The Kushners had their their share of good times mm -hmm. in China. Sure. Remember the real estate deal that Kushner had, and uh, Ivanka had those trademarks for all sorts of things, including electric voting machines, because oh, everyone that, has those. Yeah, you know the those. EB five visas his sister yeah. was selling. That yeah, that's was right. that's the good stuff. Yeah, that's that's there. <laughs> And then, of course, you know, they were put together, the Kushners, uh, and stayed together because of the lovely Cupid-like intervention of Rupert Murdoch's former wife, Wendy the, Deng. The, the um, lovely MSS agent, Wendy Deng. Who is a Chinese spy. Yes, correct. She's a Chinese spy. And she... Straight uh, up. <laughs> straight up. They've been warned about her, but she also saved their relationship, which isn't that nice that she was able to do that for them. You know, such is the power of love. Also, such is the power of the dollar. Did you know that just in this month alone, Rupert Murdoch loaned another $150 million from a Chinese I, I, bank. I saw bank that. Of China. I saw that go by. I'd yeah. be like, wait, wait, wait a second. What? He's, he did take out a loan. He's at $100 million, sorry, US dollars from the Bank of China. It's part of a you know trillion dollar or something else arrangement that he has with a bunch of banks. But amongst those banks, even in the midst of them supporting Russia in Ukraine, he is taking out $100 million. And when you read Richard Murdoch's papers or you watch Fox News, they seem vehemently opposed to China. They're sort of, they froth at the mouth at the idea of China and we, all the time. And here he is going to China, getting it's hundred hilarious. million dollars from them. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. But there you go. There's a, you know, they're good for some money apparently. So, you know, right yeah, now, yeah. Donald Trump is not allowed on Twitter, but it makes you think, well, maybe, you know, China liking Donald Trump and China liking Rupert Murdoch and all these other people, they may ask Elon Musk to, you know, you think maybe in exchange for letting you sell more Teslas or whatever it is you want, maybe uh, you'll put Donald Trump back on Twitter for us because he's going to be running in the next elections, maybe? I don't know. Could happen. Maybe that's what he meant by free speech. It is, yes, as, as limited by the laws of the country, that whatever that the country might be. Yeah. So, <laughs> we're, we're yeah, so we're just, says. yeah, maybe China and, you know, their partners russia and you know whoever else is on that list north korea north korea right yeah maybe Ron, they'd love Ron, donald maybe. trump back on twitter for when the january 6th committee convenes in a couple of weeks oh it could be it could be that that would be exactly the kind of thing that they might be looking for you know donald trump says he's not interested because he's He's lying, but he's also saying he's not interested because he's got his own Truth Social, which took a loss because of this Twitter thing of $1.5 billion yesterday. Isn't that interesting that Truth Social wrote down a loss of $1.5 billion just as Elon Musk gets approved as the new buyer of Twitter? So, well, Isn't that Devin Nunes, the CEO there? Yeah, 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 it is. Man, it wow, seems, he, you know. He, he sucks at this. He sucks at a lot of things. Well, it does sound like someone might be um, uh, evading taxes and everything else that you might need in funneling a one and a half billion dollars to the shareholders of Truth Social. I mean, that's what I would think might be happening. Again, I'm not a business person, and but you know, it's worth a look. The DOJ J might want to take a look at how you know they were able to, on this particular day, get one point five billion dollar write down on their yeah. failed Truth Social. Uh yeah, by the way, you know, if you commit fraud and bankruptcy, that's a crime, by yeah. the way. Turns yeah. out oh, that's it's illegal. As we say around the house. Turns out that's illegal. It's illegal. So, okay, yeah. so can, uh, can I riff a little bit on you, Mr. Nunes? You there? go right ahead. You go right ahead. So Nunes goes and he starts uh, the CEO of uh, Trump's new thing, right? Yes. During all the hearings we had about the Russian influence on the election, you might get the sense that Nunes was actually, you know, compromised by the Russians or something. But Nunes is probably more a product of China. Uh, back in 2015, 16, when he was on the intelligence committee, he was trying to push for the NATO Fusion Intelligence Center to, instead of being built in the United Kingdom, to be built in the Isores Islands of Portugal. Mm -hmm. Now, Portugal is, in fact, a NATO member. But the Azores is an unusual place. It's very remote. Getting personnel there and keeping them there would be pretty tough. But you know, they don't. You might ask, how do they have satellite, or how do they? Sorry, how do they have internet connections? Mm -hmm. And up until recently, they would only had like satellite internet, which is not very good quality, right? So you need like a fat pipe. So somebody had paid to tap into a transatlantic cable 
Oh. And link it from there's like a transatlantic cable that goes from like straight from Florida to Sicily, believe it or not, that carries all this data. And you can, if you pay money, you can build a spur off that. Oh, that's fancy. Nice. Yeah. And so that cable was tapped into and brought to the Azores by the Huawei company. Oh, yeah. The spy phone company. Yeah. That's right. De- yeah. And Devin Nunes was pushing to get the NATO Fusion Intelligence Center, the new one, placed mm. on top of Huawei gear. Mm. There was a, uh, a, a back and forth <laughs> between a lot of people who didn't know that, now did they? Yeah, I didn't um, know that. That's really fascinating. So you want to tap the Fusion Center into the spy yeah, network of yeah. China? Yeah. They, they're the, one of the greatest back and forth performances in Washington history was between him and Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, with his whole you yeah. know, yes, scary you know guy. Midwestern, you know, unelicitable, you know, can't get a single piece of information out of him. He doesn't want to give yeah. you kind of face. Yeah. They're going back and forth. And Devin Nunes is trying to push on like, well, the Azores is a, a great place. Actually, that would not be very good. <laughs> well, you know, what's the problem with it? Well, they're, you know, remote islands in the middle of the Atlantic. You know, we have things in Hawaii and that's not a problem. Yeah, yeah, that's we, not true. They're our problem. Uh, well, it's nice. People love to be there. Actually, no, there's few school choices. There's this, you know, getting yeah. personnel there is actually hard. I know my wife and I were stationed there for two or three years. Like, <laughs> and it's just, and he's just pushing like, you know, it's like, but there's no reason we, you know, why not Portugal? Well, um, well, the difference between you know, the Azores and Hawaii. Another one is that we own Hawaii there. That's yeah. a U.S. state. And this yeah. is not. And so, you know, and you got to think in the background, he doesn't want to say it, but he would love to be able to, you know, just scream into the mic like, asshole, we are yeah. not going to put the NATO Intelligence Center on Huawei <laughs> gear. Now go away. In Azores. In Azores. You know who also is involved in Truth Social Trump's, you know, $1.5 billion like slush fund? You want to take Cash a Patel. Cash Patel. Cash Patel. I mean, Cash <laughs> it's, Patel. Like a, it's like a who's who of the uh, 20, the first insurrection. The first, oh, what is on the insurrection? It's the impeachment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the first oh, impeachment. Oh, no, yeah. he was. Uh, was he, the second he was impeachment. Position. I think he was part of the insurrection too. He was too. everywhere. He was too. Yes, he was. He was yeah. Cash. It's interesting. His name's Cash. We were just talking about they may be getting a. $150 billion dollars in cash from uh, Patel. Yeah. I wonder who he works for. Devin Nunes as well, partially in the past. So just to bring it all full circle, because I do want to celebrate something um, really incredible is that, uh, you know, he's not as rich as he says he is. He's got a problem with LIDAR or LIDAR. He's got China everywhere in his world, but also soon GM and Ford are going to be all over him and they are going to drag down his stock price and his capability of competing in this marketplace. And because we um, are fans of GM and I thought you might want to see the uh, car that they've got that uh, they replaced, you know, there'll be a competition for, for the Tesla. So uh, Mary Barra, the female CEO of GM, took a ABC correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis, on a little test ride. So should we take a look? Because why not? So this is the Cadillac Lyric. An electric twist on an American classic. You got it. And you don't hear the noise. Sharing her company's goal to dominate the U.S. EV market by 2025. It it rides very much like I would expect a car to, but without the sound. And surpass Elon Musk's Tesla in sales. How do you talk about Elon Musk? You know, I respect all of our competitors, but it doesn't consume a lot of my day. If you are going to win in this space, when we win, you will have half to have beaten Elon Musk and Tesla. How are you going to do that? I have tremendous confidence in our brands, the strength of our brands, in our customers and the loyalty that we have. Next year, GM expects to unveil two additional EVs, both under $40,000. And Barras is focused on the cars as she is with how Americans will be able to charge them. It's going to be uh, many solutions. You know, right now there's a lot of startups working in this space and we're partnering with them. We have committed to invest three quarters of a billion dollars in chargers, working with other companies as well as our dealers to find the right locations. You know, that's a telling clip right there. Of, uh, yeah, that was, of that was the enjoyable. I got a lot out of that. Yeah, that was, yeah. You know, again, things that perhaps they'd like to say, there's like, well, so, you know, what's it going to be like to compete with Elon Musk? Oh, you mean the guy who's dependent on the country 
that our Department of Defense is mm-hmm. moving to disrupt their supply chain yeah. so that he can't build his products and they can't build them either? Oh, actually, the first well, protocol. Of the, we have a lot of respect for him. Yeah, like, our, like all yeah, very. We, we we don't really think about it, but you know, they're sending the first yeah. batch of GM lyrics. They're sending them to China, in fact, to disrupt <laughs> Tesla's market over there because uh, you know, just because. Oh, uh, yeah, because. Here we go. Uh, China, you want to send your Teslas over here? We're going to send our uh, lyrics over there, and we'll see who wins because the market will decide. See what I And, you know, look, the, think of, you know, some of our, our recent adversaries have a real long view, right? The Chinese more than anybody. You know, Detroit was, you know, broken and gutted in, you know, the latter part of the 20th century. And people forget it was America's wealthiest city in 1960. Was, right, I believe, right, yeah. per capita, I believe it was wealthier than New York, I believe. And at least, in, I mean, GDP output, I know the old wealth throws the curves off. But in any event, and I think it was the fifth wealthiest in the world, something like that. You know, Detroit. Detroit Steel, you know, the automobile yeah. industry drove the rest of the United States. And they're also a defense contractor and all that. And, you know, I think slowly rotting away at the U.S. auto industry and, you know, particularly its capital Detroit, uh, you know, watching that be eroded and destroyed probably, you know, was no small amount of pleasure for our adversaries. And this is, you know, I see more, you know, power moves out of Joe Biden than, and I've seen, you know, from any presidency. And he really is something stuff, else. He really is impressive. You know, I got to say, when you really look at the moves he's making and you don't look at the young warrior about what he's, how he sounds, because that doesn't really make him a good president. It just makes him a good speaker. But the moves he makes, the actual policy decisions, the actual world chess game that he's playing is top notch. I mean, it does not get any better than this guy. He has mapped this out. He's not even breaking a sweat over it. And it's the most sophisticated game you've ever seen. I mean, you know, we're, and there's so much other news that we, yeah. you know, haven't covered, but, you know, we just extradited the head of uh, a foreign country. The former head of Honduras was extradited to America to face charges on drug trafficking. For- does it? selling 500,000 kilos of cocaine. Oh. And Ooh. apparently that's a lot. You can get high on that for sure. I have no experience with cocaine <laughs> at all, but I, I 500,000 kilos is apparently quite a bit. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, so he was extradited. That's interesting. So they're getting, uh, so, you know, he's also pardoned three people today on, I think, on Secret Service. I, haven't, for... I saw it. I haven't caught up with what went down there. But, you know, we're indicting people all over the world for corruption. Na- the picture, just- that picture you're pointing out earlier of, of Zelensky and uh, Austin and uh, Austin Blinken. on one side and, and Blinken on the yeah, other. I mean, and it's like, hi, you want to have proxy wars? Yeah. How'd you like that? Yeah. And we're doing yes, Kiev. We're here. <laughs> you we're know, here. We're big, open. We're moves. reopening. Good. Yeah. Mo- hi, we're we're done. Now. Did you have fun with your little war? Was that yeah. OK? Good. We're reopening the embassy. By the way, we brought a bunch of boxes back here that maybe have um, <sighs> I don't know, some weapons, Kaboom. maybe. We're going to get more. Uh, Austin said he was going to move heaven and earth to get all these weapons to the Ukrainians. And I believed him when he said it because he sounded quite serious about it. Generally, you want to believe Austin. He's very... Um, uh, oh, yeah, the Marine, yeah. intense Marine general yeah. officer look. Yeah, you know, this looks some good moves. There's no doubt. Finland and Sweden are joining NATO, mm-hmm. right? Or, you know, are very close to doing so. And yeah. there's a very funny Twitter account. Uh, it's like Sputnik Not, I think it is. It's, it's a Sputnik parody account. And uh, it's got a, you know, there's a picture of Putin looking all dejected. And it says, you know, Putin's strategy of overwhelm NATO by throwing too many brand new members at it is not working out. And no. No, it's not. It's, it's really interesting. Is that what they said? That was the headline? It's, that was the joke. Yeah. yeah. That was you know, it's, I should mention as well, because it just came to my mind, and I, I should mention this earlier, that the reason we have a GM these days, is, and I know GOPs will bristle at this idea, that Republicans will bristle at this idea that you can credit Barack Obama for this, but you can credit Barack Obama for GM still even being around as yeah, a they build it up. to take on Tesla. So for those of you who are all like, oh, Barack Obama was the end of the world and the worst president ever, not at all, probably one of the best, but also the guy who saved GM, who allows us now to take on Tesla with this brand new Lyric car. So, you know, Chrysler got merged with Fiat and there's been huge scandals of bribery and union corruption and all this other stuff. Yeah. And, you know, they got in Oops. and what happened to that company got taken over by private equity. Mm. And, you know, 
we, you know, to you know, merged with other companies and some of our enemies have been engaged in full spectrum war that, you know, our economic, cultural, political, everything. And, but the You're economic destroy war, America. Yeah. And that, the moves yeah. that these guys have been making, that Biden and Obama have made have really, um, frankly, saved this country. So, you know, we'll see, you know, but there's some power moves and yeah. I always look, you know, on the strategic landscape, I look for a counter move from somebody that's supposed to be a peer, right? Yeah. So if we do something provocative, you know, they do something provocative back, you know, showing, and that's how we communicate. Yeah. Right now, there's a lot of America says, this is how this is going to be. And then the other side, Russia and China are not as much America's peer as they imagined. No and way. no, and because of and COVID, it's going to get worse China. for them. Yeah. I mean, COVID has really, uh, you know, hit China badly suddenly at this at tail end of the pandemic. And it's, you know, they're basically have kids coming to school in hazmat suits and you've got neighborhoods being uh, fenced off. I mean, they've really taken it quite seriously. They, they, they announced a whole new uh, round of new government paid for construction in order to just keep the co economy afloat. Um, you saw it. That's it was interesting because uh, Evergrande, their, you know, their largest real estate holdings company, if yeah. I have that correct, has collapsed into bankruptcy and, you know, the shell game's over. Yeah, it's, it's kind of done and it's clear to everybody and there's no response. I mean, are they, yes, you can buy a port in the Solomon Islands or whatever it is that they did, but really, you know, there is no game left here. There is no, they're out of bandwidth and they've, uh, the Russian armies, I mean, may, they'll try again, but they're just going to get completely destroyed. So in the next round of invasion into Ukraine and China is sitting there on the sidelines, you know, still supporting Russia in this horrendous genocide. There's no goodness that comes out of that. There's just nothing. Uh, no and do you know who also loses with, you know, if Ukraine is a Western facing NATO member is China. China has started investing enormously in Ukraine once right. Trump took over. I think for a few years before that, they've had longstanding ties anyhow. Some that go back centuries, like literally back to the, the Orthodox had a thing on the, the Chinese throne. It's very interesting. I looked into the, yeah. the the background, but they had really put a lot of money in. They tried um, to make a play for it. They obviously uh, were outbid by the Americans because Zelensky looked very happy next to Austin and Lincoln, They're quite satisfied with I mean, the choices he'd made. So, you know, speculation. Would you mean, <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> the Russian retirement plan isn't very good. You know, no. like when they're, you're no longer useful to them. It's not, like, <laughs> it's not Notice the amount of people watch in the, and a pat on the back. The amount of mining executives that have sort of disappeared recently or Gazprom executives that have just died. I mean, in these like outrageous shootings and, you know, no follow up by the police or anything like that. It's just like that. <laughs> the Russian retirement plan yeah. isn't very good <laughs> when they're done good. with you. <laughs> when they're done with you, they're done with you. Uh, this and we're is done with all, you. These, <laughs> all these people's I may, you know, Tucker Carlson, you know, it's like, well, why not vote root for Vladimir Putin? Why not? Yeah. You know, yeah. why not? It's like, have you read up on him? Do you, yeah. you, like, you do your research, buddy. Also, you know, China is Tucker, it turns out. Look at that China and that $100 million that uh, pay for Tucker's salary in the next couple of years. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> next time he does an anti-China story, just maybe someone should remind him that uh, who's fitting the bull there. This is a story we should open up for the audience uh, more as time goes on. There's a lot of stuff that has looked like other countries that has been China. Yes. There's a bunch of stuff Israel gets up to that's really China. Yes. There's a bunch of, there's a ton of Russian stuff. Uh, Saudi stuff, China. Yeah, the UAE is kind of like the you know the Chinese you know Western consulate. Yeah, you know the GOP kind of China sometimes. Kind of China as well. China, a lot of yeah. the California Democrats, a lot yeah. of China. I mean, China. they had a lot of money, yeah. and you know they could buy a lot of stuff. Yeah. So you know, that's how it happens. But you know they've sent us maybe a little too much fentanyl to try and murder us all. <laughs> oh, it's getting awkward. He's getting awkward. And Elon Musk, I'll predict that he's not, he's going to have a very hard time actually buying Twitter. I think we've laid out a pretty good case of why it would be a really shitty, awful idea to let him do so because you would really just be giving it, as Bezos says, to China, and we don't want to do that because we like our Twitter the way it is. My idea is we indict and incarcerate Louis DeJoy, mm -hmm. and then we have the U.S. Postal Service take That's over. Twitter. 
I love that idea of yours. I think it's such a smart idea. The postal service needs a, a reinvention. It needs a modernization. They are good at this stuff. They actually already do this stuff. This is what they do. So you know, adds you don't even have to necessarily write new regulations. You sort of extend the regulations they have, and kind they of. already are equipped to do it. And it'll modernize the entire place, give them new revenue sources, make everyone seem so much happier. You know. And if you commit a crime using Twitter, then there'll yeah. be the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. If you want to sell drugs here, they'll figure that out. Yeah. They'll, you know, and look. Intelligence operations that you might want to run against people into, you know, defame them or discredit them, th those kinds Ooh. of things. Yeah, those would be kind of things that they showed up to, to arrest Steve Bannon for that kind of thing, right? They, they could show up and do that yeah, to right. other people. They're, you know, it's a good idea. I like what you're saying. I like the uh, solution there. So, yeah. And it's guided by the rule of law. Yeah. Automatically. We don't need Elon's help in deciding how the rule of law should work. Yes. With it, we've already got the law. Yeah. And if you break the law, then we'll have a problem with it. Yeah. But Thank otherwise, you. we Thanks won't have that. a problem. Yeah. So maybe Elon should, if he wants to buy it, maybe then he should give it to the U.S. Postal Service to run forever. You know, if he really wants to be such a charitable person and such a free speech advocate, then maybe that's the solution. Much easier than having to do it himself. He already works so hard in Tesla and SpaceX. What does he need to run a social media network for? I mean, just. He should take some time off. You oh, know, yeah. enjoy the finer things in life. Yeah, exactly. He works 120 hours a week. Boy, yeah. we should go. We should go because we'll keep talking. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight, everybody. Uh, until tomorrow night. Good night, Eric. And good night, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Narrative is made possible by viewers like you. Join today and support truly independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative. That's patreon.com forward slash narrative.